Hi everyone and welcome to the week 6 lecture. Um, this week we are talking about crime prevention through environmental design and I've tried to make it a bit more interesting. Um, this week I've actually recorded part of my lecture while moving through urban space um, as well. Um, just to you know make it a bit more interesting than hearing my voice um, you know for an hour over these slides so anyway we'll see how that goes um, and just a reminder to keep um, you know if you haven't started preparing for your uh, first assessment you um, should really um, get onto that as well So let's just do a bit of a recap on last week. Last week we talked about situational crime prevention. Now recall that situational crime prevention um, brings with it a set of particular theoretical assumptions. You have the rational choice perspective, the routine activities approach, and crime pattern theory. Now remember that situational crime prevention uses an evidence-based methodology to inform ongoing practice. So particular interventions will be evaluated and assessed and that information will be disseminated to inform future practice. So in that sense it is um, continually updated. Now, there are five key um, axioms, and within each axiom there are various associated techniques with situational crime prevention. Now, the five of those um, were, well, the first one was increasing efforts, the second, increasing risks, the third, reducing reward, the fourth, reducing provocations, and the fifth was removing excuses. So you can see how these axioms relate back to the rational choice perspective and routine activities theory. It relates back to rational choice because it assumes that um, the motivated offender is trying to maximize their utility, maximize the payoff from committing a crime, and it relates to routine activities approach because it um, feeds into that three um, factor model where you have the motivated offender, the potential target or victim, and um, the uh, capable guardianship or lack thereof. Now, recall that situational crime prevention has about 40 years of evaluation research behind it. So it's a demonstrably effective way for reducing the harms of crime. And also recall that it needs to be context specific and problem oriented. Now just another reminder about the first assessment coming up. It's the 1000 word research exercise critical account. Now, this week we are looking at the third option listed, the crime prevention through environmental design option. Um, so if you're doing this topic, um, you'll want to listen to this lecture, you're going to be looking at the environmental design features of the King's Cross nightclub precinct. You could um, use Google Maps or Google Earth. Uh, or you could, you know, visit the place if you so wish. You don't have to, it's, it's all up to you. Um, but yeah, that's something you could um, consider doing. Now, as I've mentioned in the past uh, couple of lectures, how do you approach this assessment? You need to be writing about why the crime prevention strategy that you've chosen for this particular situation is the best one. 
Now, that doesn't mean it's the perfect strategy. You need to also demonstrate that you understand there are limitations. But you explain why, even with these limitations, um, this strategy is still, um, in your view, the most appropriate one for the given case. Now, you know, it helps to take into account some of the publicity around the incident that will help you understand the context a little bit more. And that's particularly salient for this week because, um, well, and last week as well, actually, these environmental approaches, broadly speaking, now remember that situational crime prevention is also considered, broadly speaking, an environmental approach. And this week we're talking about environmental design. So both of those approaches um, are context sensitive. They are about being mindful of the particular context within which um, crime occurs and taking into account some of the publicity and media and all of that stuff to do with this case can help develop a better sense of the context of uh, what was happening. And as usual, you need to use at least eight academic sources. Um, you should do some media research, but um, that is not in place of the academic sources. You, by all means, should use government policy documents or statistics, if you so wish and discuss any issues with your tutor sooner rather than later. Don't put it off. Um, there's no shame in seeking help. That's what we're all here for. In this week's lecture, we are going to be looking at crime prevention through environmental design. So this will encompass uh, talking about environmental approaches and thinking more generally. Then we will look at some of the underlying theory behind um, crime prevention through environmental design. We'll discuss a little bit about this idea of natural surveillance. We'll go over another important theoretical concept of defensible space. And then we will talk about some more specific techniques. So, you may be familiar with the so-called broken windows theory, um, which has been somewhat influential in these environmental approaches to crime. Basically, at the heart of it, there's this idea that people um, monitor the spaces that they move through for any signs um, that order, you know, uh, is being preserved. So what that means is that things like a lack of maintenance, i.e. the broken windows, <laughs> or visible vandalism, graffiti, run-down footpaths, that sort of thing, becomes interpreted as community breakdown. So in a sense, the physical, material conditions of um, public space become symbols um, for the condition of the social um, conditions, the um, strength or weakness of the community. So in these areas with poor maintenance, people um, tend to avoid the area according to Broken Windows thesis. As a result, potential offenders see these um, symptoms as a lack of capable guardianship Okay, so remember our crime triangle. Lack of maintenance is a sign to a motivated offenders that capable guardianship is absent from this space. So as a result, this area becomes viewed as a good opportunity for crime. So 
we are going beyond broken windows and hotspots in environmental theory. Now, one environmental approach which we are talking about this week is crime prevention through environmental design. So that sort of incorporates aspects of urban planning and architectural design and maintenance practices. Another environmental approach that we have already discussed um, is situational crime prevention, which is focused interventions in specific situations. Now, you'll also remember we discussed social prevention in an earlier lecture. And so something to keep in mind is that environmental and social protection, uh, prevention, sorry, are not necessarily mutually exclusive. So there's no inconsistency between understanding or employing these sorts of prevention techniques and crime responses that are more inclusive than law and order approaches. Now there are different evidence bases regarding the proven capacity of situational crime prevention and crime prevention through environmental design to reduce crime. Situational prevention has at least 40 years of evaluation research supporting it, in favour of it, and this is what we talked about last week. Um, with regard to environmental design prevention, evaluations so far have been less favourable, although the evidence base in favour of this approach is improving. Now, in different contexts around the world, these two approaches have had different influences on policy and practice. Situational crime prevention has held more sway in the United Kingdom and in parts of Europe. On the other hand, crime prevention through environmental design has had a major influence in the Australian context. So there are a few things to take into account when considering uh, environmental design uh, prevention approaches. This crime prevention approach concerns itself with broad-based urban planning and architectural design. It does draw on some aspects of situational crime prevention. However, the key aim in this week's topic um, is how the influence of people's perceptions of their built environment relates to the ways that public space becomes defined and used by people. So part of the task is to understand how non-problem uses of space can be encouraged by creating objectively and subjectively safe environments. Part of that includes um, understanding how certain less preferred uses of space, for example crime, can be discouraged through both physical and symbolic barriers and changes or modifications that get made to an area. In effect, we are using barriers and modifications to generate effective systems of social control and surveillance. It's important to understand that public space is defined, which means it's made and enacted through social processes. For example, people's shared perceptions of space, the land use planning, the decisions that get made in relationship to that, how different territories or areas are enforced through different forms of um, social control and authority, all of that plays a role in actually defining space. So it's important in this framework to understand that public space is not just a given, it's not just there, it didn't fall out of the sky, it was made. Now, such definitions or enactments of public space can function to exclude certain groups. For example, young people from shopping malls um, um, and neoliberal formations of the use of space. If you've done the Juvenile Crime and Justice Unit, um, you'll recall the discussions about young people's struggles for subjectivity in public space. 
and also keep in mind the contemporary neoliberal spatial politics of public space. We now have hybrid spaces, publicly accessible but privately owned spaces, you have pop-up shops and food trucks turning public spaces into commercial spaces and so on and so on. So that means that a space is not the same thing um, throughout time but it changes um, depending on the social context. In 1961, Jane Jacobs released The Death and Life of Great American Cities. Now, in this work, it was argued that unrestrained commercial and industrial development was the main reason that U.S. cities became desolate zones uh, with high rates of crime and other social problems. In conjunction with this was the fragmentation of land use into specifically concentrated zones uh, and this inadvertently helped cities become custom built for crime. So what this is getting at is how you know some areas or parts of the city are industrial, some will be residential uh, and so on. Now, because of a lack of a residential area in inner cities, uh, it meant that people would go out to the suburbs to go home at night. As a result, empty cities at night attracted people who didn't want to be observed by others. Uh, and um, on the flip side of that, residential suburban neighbourhoods became devoid of capable guardianship during the day because people were at work, or school, or uni, and so on. Jacobs made the point that you can enhance natural surveillance through planning, ensuring that the design features of city buildings support natural surveillance, and that you need to provide opportunities for people to exert social control during normal routine activities. So for Jacobs, a key solution here um, is to draw people back to city centres. And you can achieve this by establishing mixed land uses and providing amenities such as shops, malls and pubs and so on, and other activities to draw people out of their homes during the day and the night. So this brings us to this idea of natural surveillance, which is basically more eyes on the street. That when there are lots of people around, there's lots of people who can bear witness to things. So, you know, the area around Parramatta, Westfield and the station is mixed land use because it's residential, it's commercial, retail, it's transport and some of the redevelopments around Alexandria and the inner city and so on are also examples of this. Another important concept here is the idea of defensible space. Now this comes from Oscar Newman who was critical of so-called modernist public housing designs. These designs focused on economies of scale which basically boiled down to cramming large numbers of people into high-rises. Now some of the problems with this are that it was difficult for residents to assert functional control over their lived environments. There were too many anonymous areas, there was poor distinctions between public and private space, poor amenities, uh, difficult natural surveillance, poor lighting, uh, and numerous access routes, unrestricted movement, and so on. And also poorly maintained facilities, you'd find that the lifts were out of order, um, broken windows, perhaps literally, um, playing into this as well. Now, what I've got up here on the slide is a photo taken from uh, Camperdown in New South Wales of 
what we might consider this modernist design of public housing. And you can see here this idea of the problem of economies of scale, of cramming large numbers of people into tall buildings. You can see how it's difficult for residents to assert any functional control or shared ownership of space because they're all compartmentalized, they're split across levels, and it's, um, you know, difficult to have these shared, um, well, you know, natural surveillance becomes difficult because people are individualized into their apartments, um, there's minimal open space, um, and so on. Now, in Newman's view, this economies of scale approach to public housing um, is a sort of way to achieve a spiral of decline into crime and disorder. So in this situation, residents are experiencing an increased fear of crime. Um, they'll retreat indoors, where uh, people who don't live there will avoid public housing areas, and then you have the stigmatizing of public estates and so on. So at this point, you might want to have a think about some of the stigma around public housing that you may have heard of, you may have experienced yourself, or perhaps even contributed to. Um, and one example that sort of plays around with these stereotypes, and I'm not saying it's a good or a bad TV show, I'm just pointing out that the uh, TV show Houses draws on some of these um, perceptions uh, about public housing um, and the experience of um, uh, lower socioeconomic uh, living circumstances um, and things like that. To manage this decline, uh, you know, Newman suggested that, um, you know, the crime in or around public housing could be reduced by dividing the territory of public housing into smaller lots. Now, the sort of more general principle to take away from that is that this helps to ensure that the physical environment is manageable on a human scale. Okay, so you can see how tall buildings with lots of people inside them become these unwieldy things for uh, people to sort of manage themselves on a day-to-day -day kind of level. Now, enabling this management on a human scale effectively allows residents to exert what we call functional control over the space. Now, this includes creating a sense of territoriality among residents. So this isn't meaning the same thing as how you know, dogs and cats are territorial and fight each other um, if they cross over into the uh, wrong area. What this is getting at is that residents um, have this desire to defend their own space, right? Because they feel a sense of belonging to it. Now again, defending doesn't mean people getting violent and telling uh, each other to stay on their side of the fence or something like that. It's saying that they feel an investment in the area that they live in. And this in turn facilitates responsibility for preserving safe, well-maintained living environment. So another way of thinking about this is that where you live, um, particularly in these um, public estate contexts, but you know, even outside of that, where you live is no longer just some slab of concrete with bricks and a roof and stuff inside it. It's actually, you know, somewhere where you feel like you belong, you start to identify with the place, you have an investment in that space. And as a result of that sort of personal investment and identification, you are more willing to make sure that antisocial, um, deviant, and criminal um, events and activities are less likely to take place.
So this brings us to the defensible space concept. Um, this model of residential environments um, that inhibits crime by uh, creating a physical expression of social fabric that defends itself. So what that kind of means in sort of plainer English is that it's about thinking about how we design residential spaces that deter um, criminal activity by creating residential spaces that actually express some kind of social fabric. So not looking at residential areas as just, you know, anonymous, same, same uh, slabs of building next to each other, but seeing a physical residential space, the material space itself, as actually signaling, um, you know, there's a community here, people have social ties, there's social capital, um, there's collective efficacy um, within this space. Now, this involves a range of mechanisms. It involves material and symbolic barriers um, to crime. It involves showing strongly defined areas of influence and it involves improved opportunities for surveillance. Now, the sort of overarching point under all of that, um, or above all of that I should say, is that the environment is brought under the control of all residents, right? So it's showing that the people who live there, as I was saying earlier, are invested in the space and they are exerting um, formal and informal social control. Now there are some critiques of defensible space theory. One of the key ones is that it gets criticised for ignoring important social factors that affect crime rates. Now the sort of key one to think about here at this stage is that public housing tends to have a higher concentration, concentration of poor, unemployed or uh, single parent families, etc. It's sort of by definition going to bring together um, a lot of folks from disadvantaged backgrounds. Um, and so, you know, some of the, um, I guess, naive applications of defensible space theory risk overlooking um, that sort of economic reality. But despite these critiques, um, Newman's theories have been applied to a wide range of contexts. Um, some examples of these are car parks, office spaces, schools, parks, and residential streets. Moving on, we come to uh, the core techniques of crime prevention through environmental design. Now, there are four of them that we can think about at this stage. We have territorial reinforcement, we have surveillance, we have access control, and we have activity support slash image management. And as with a lot of things we've discussed during the course, these core components, techniques, elements, and so on, are not um, standalone right? Um, they will overlap and interact with each other. Now, there's this concept of territorial reinforcement, and it's about generating and confirming a sense of ownership of space by so-called approved users. It's about discouraging illegitimate uses of space, and creating and maintaining what we call spatial hierarchies, ensuring clear, well-recognized boundaries between public and private. Now, this can be achieved 
through the use of physical and symbolic barriers. And there are four um, distinct categories of public, semi-public, semi-private, and private space. So more specifically, um, with territorial reinforcement and barriers, some of the things that barriers can include are things like hedges and walls between public and private areas, um, signs, you know, signposting. You might have seen a notice saying something like you're entering, pri entering private property. Even vegetation or changes in a surface, you know, changing um, tiles or, or, or brickwork on the ground. These things can be used to create so-called zones of transition that give people cues that they are moving or, you know, transitioning from a public to a private space. Now, of course, do not confuse this with talk about zones of transition um, when it comes to Chicago school concentric zone theory, just forget about that for now, if you're familiar with that theory. Um, when it comes to uh, crime prevention through environmental design, it's just talking about signaling to people in that space that they're moving from public to private or private to public areas. Now these zones of transition make it easier for residents and other people who are meant uh, to be there uh, to keep an eye on the area. And it also makes it more legitimate for people who have a um, sense of belonging and ownership in the area to challenge um, other people's, uh, I guess, right or presence uh, in that space, especially when it seems like they are intruding. So I guess another way of phrasing that is when a space is clearly marked, um, when a territory is clearly established through some of these barriers, signposting um, techniques and so on, it makes it easier for people to enforce informal social control. Now the other um, core aspect to think about is surveillance. Now this includes formal and informal surveillance. Now the uh, main thing to think about here is that Surveillance increases the perceived risks associated with offending because it increases the likelihood that that behavior will be observed. Now, let's think back to our crime triangle model again and think back to the rational actor kind of theory behind the motivated offender. Increasing the perceived risks is altering that ratio between risk and reward, right? Heightening the risk makes the reward of committing any crime um, less um, favorable in relationship to that risk, okay? So, surveillance aims to increase the potential for intervention, apprehension, and prosecution, okay? Um, it achieves all of these things, or at least it signals all of the possibilities of this stuff occurring. And this is supposed to um, deter a motivated offender in these situations. Now coming back more specifically to um, the informal mode of surveillance, you have um, what we call a natural surveillance. So. This can apply to both internal areas and external areas. When we're talking about internal areas, this could be inside a supermarket, in an undercover car park, in your office and that sort of thing. And when we're talking about external areas, we're talking about streets, car parks, open air car parks, bus shelters, train stations, and that sort of thing. Now, part of natural surveillance is ensuring that there are clear, visible sight lines, okay? So individuals can observe and be observed as they go about their routine activities. So the visible sight lines idea is that there aren't obstructions to people in that area being able to look out and see what's going on, you know, across the car park 
at the other end of the train station and so on. And the flip side of that is that it means if you can see that, um, you can also be seen, right? So it's sort of like a two-way surveillance idea. And so that will include positioning, right? Paths, shops and houses and such so that they can be seen by adjoining users. So it means not designing a space such that, you know, there's no clear straight um, walkway. Uh, it means not designing a space so that no one can kind of sit, look around and see what's going on, that there's a big wall in front of them or something like that. Now, things like well-lit areas and activity generators um, and facilities that increase the outdoor use of space are other aspects of this informal surveillance. Um, when we're talking about outdoor use of space, we're thinking about balconies, yards, and pathways, and so on. And these aspects of design attract people who can act as watchers or gatekeepers in a space, right? You just think about it, if you live in an area where there's uh, no scope for people to use the footpath, or, or use a bicycle, or something like that, or for people to sit out on the front on their porch, or whatever, um, people are just less likely to be outside in, in public or outdoor space. And if everybody's inside their houses, they're not looking outside. There's no uh, surveillance happening. Now, when we talk about formal surveillance, what this achieves is that it increases the guardianship and place management of an area. And this usually involves assigning responsibility for formal surveillance to a designated third party. Now, this formal surveillance can be part of that third party's routine activities. So, for example, a concierge um, in a building, uh, the bar staff, private security, people working in a store or a shop, attendants, and so on. And this can also include mechanical surveillance, like CCTV, um, although this is usually more closely associated with situational crime prevention rather than crime prevention through environmental design. Um, part of the, I guess, thinking here is that when we're looking at um, environmental design prevention, um, we are trying to incorporate and use people who use that environment as part of the formal and informal surveillance um, processes. Now, when we talk about the third uh, core concept, access control, um, what this is talking about is, uh, well, the encouragement and restriction and channeling of activities to deny access to a potential target. So what does that mean? Well, there are informal, formal, and mechanical strategies of access control. Similar to um, when we were talking about formal and informal surveillance and mechanical surveillance just previously. The informal strategies um, refer to natural features that change um, the spatial definition of particular locations. So more specifically, that might mean changes in land elevation, going up a ramp or going up steps, um, garden beds, road closures, and celebrated entries that signify movement from public to private space. So making it obvious that you know there's an entry to a building or an area rather than just not bothering to signpost it at all. When we talk about formal access control, um, this is more purposeful and organized. It's, I guess, informal strategies, are, you might be able to describe them as passive, and formal strategies are more active. And these are usually um, done by third parties who can deny access to a space. So this is what many of you are probably familiar with when we talk about uh, security guards, receptionists, a ticket collector, and that sort of thing. And then we have mechanical access control, which refers to gates and barriers. Um, so an entry phone where you have to buzz in, um, uh, you know, bollards to prevent people driving down an alleyway, and that sort of thing. And now that brings us to the fourth um, 
core concept of activity support. So, um, facilities and amenities in safe locations with improved natural surveillance means that we're trying to encourage activities in locations um, that are capable of supporting those activities. Um, now you may find that certain activities or features are incorporated into particular locations to serve as what we might call magnets for ordinary people whose mere presence discourages crime because of the increased natural surveillance and so on. Um, so this might involve mixed land use, so incorporating residential, recreational, entertainment and restaurant precincts into the one area rather than you know, splitting them out, as was one of the critiques um, I was talking about earlier of, you know, modernist design and um, land use planning. And it's about generating activity throughout the day and the night to ensure that areas are not abandoned. Um, so this is linking back to that idea of how every if everyone's living in the suburbs the suburbs are empty during the day because everyone's at school or work and then when they return home after work the city becomes empty because no one's in the offices we are trying to avoid that situation and it also means giving various resident groups dedicated spaces so you know um, different um, members of the community have different needs uh, and you know well experience different forms of disadvantage so it's by it's you know I mean you, you have a like a children's playground in one one point maybe an area that's set up and more appropriate for um, older citizens uh, or areas where teenagers are more likely to um, spend their time now another part of activity support is image management um, and this involves reinforcing the intended use of the space through appropriate design and management rather than just leaving groups to sort it out by themselves. And this is to help reduce conflicts over space. Um, another aspect is we want to prevent areas from being abandoned. So with appropriate activity support, the image of an area improves and then this attracts more legitimate users to the area. Image management also relates to um, addressing incivilities and removing signs of crime. So cleaning up after graffiti and vandalism and removing abandoned vehicles and rubbish and so on. Because these signs undermine people's perceptions of safety. Um, well-managed uh, places or places with um, quality image management will send out positive messages that the area is under control. And again, these aspects of image management can be carried out by a designated third party, such as a property management or man sorry property manager or a groundskeeper, for example. Now let's have a look at some of the limits, challenges and critiques of crime prevention through environmental design. It's not a flawless approach and I don't think um, you know, any one prevention approach could be considered flawless, right? Territoriality enhancement, you know, developing a sense of ownership over space and belonging might only actually work in neighborhoods with high levels of home ownership, for example. So if everybody's renting, um, they literally don't feel a sense of ownership over the place, right? And different demographics might not have, uh, sorry, different demographics in a particular space uh, might not have enough of a sense of ownership of place. Another critique comes from the observation that Contemporary complex societies seem to be characterized by a reduced ability or desire um, from onlookers to intervene in issues. So something to just keep in mind is that various social variables, right, different um, social variables will affect whether crime prevention through environmental design is effective. And 
I think that this ties in with something that I've been saying across a few of the lectures now is that the prevention technique needs to be context sensitive. It needs to relate back to the specific place and time to which it is being applied. Another thing to think about is offender motivations. There's the possibility that highly motivated offenders may not actually be deterred by environmental features or take note of environmental modifications. So maybe you have a highly motivated offender, maybe they're, you know, more, I guess, desperate or something like that, and they may not actually be deterred by these environmental features. That said, you know, not all potential offenders may be that determined at all. And so others will take note of environmental changes. But one of the recurrent criticisms is that there's a tendency to ignore how social processes interact with physical environments um, to influence how these environments are used. Now let's briefly talk about second generation uh, crime prevention through environmental design. Now this places an emphasis on risk assessments. These are surveys of real and perceived crime levels. It incorporates socio-economic and demographic profiling and processes of community consultation and participation. So second generation um, draws on the core concepts of the original uh, crime prevention through environmental design idea while maintaining that it is essential to understand the social characteristics of particular neighbourhoods, uh, you know, whether residents participate in a neighbourhood's social life, for example. And it's about making sure that crime prevention through environmental design is integrated in broader community development processes. So when applying these principles, it needs to be informed by in-depth problem analysis. So this isn't that different from um, situational crime prevention. And various site survey and safety audit methodologies have been uh, developed um, to help with this. So basically, preliminary work is an essential part of the process. Now, I don't want to go into the site surveys aspect into too much um, detail, but just be aware that it's about a detailed understanding of the problems that affect a location. Um, there are different methodologies that have been developed ranging from simple to complex checklists, uh, but one of the sort of issues with this uh, site survey approach is that they do, they, they are affected by um, subjective interpretations because different people will interpret sites differently. Now something to keep in mind with the implementation of these measures is that it doesn't need to be a, a wholesale redesign of an area. Uh, these principles can be used in both the pre-planning stage and also as retrofitting when problems do emerge. Um, but also be aware that from the perspective of urban designers and architects, often they're actually adhering to a lot of these principles anyway, but more for aesthetic rather than crime prevention reasons. So you may see buildings and urban layouts that seem to be informed by um, crime prevention through environmental design mm -hmm. techniques, but were actually not designed um, with crime prevention in mind, although it may still function in that way. Now, some of the challenges and opportunities facing implementation is that it's popular with what we call crime prevention and community safety officers and agencies because it gives them some authority in planning and, and development processes. It's popular with the public and private sector because it um, promises crime reduction by modifying physical environments rather than expensive social interventions. But it also means that you need um, mainstream planning processes to provide evidence that they've taken account of some of these principles. And requiring this to take place 
imposes additional costs on the infrastructure development. And state and local governments are under pressure not to impede investment uh, by imposing additional burdens on the private sector. So some conclusions. There are both ethical and practical reasons for ensuring that large-scale crime prevention includes these environmental approaches. Um, it's perceived as less judgmental than social prevention because it's less like what some detractors might call social engineering. Now what crime prevention through uh, environmental design emphasizes is creating orderly and amenable spaces that generate user-friendly environments that therefore have crime preventing potential. And when properly applied, it can provide a sense of ontological security for people, that is, confidence and trust in the environment within which people live. And from a practical point of view, environmental prevention provides options that agencies can actually implement. Now, importantly, much like social prevention, um, you know, crime prevention through environmental design uh, can and should empower communities by providing them with knowledge and the capacity to concert control over the factors that are making them insecure. Strategies that focus only on root causes, such as poverty, social dislocation and disadvantage and so on, can be disempowering for local communities who lack the resources to actually address the problems. So with the emphasis on opportunity reduction, environmental prevention can provide the basis for programs that local actors can influence directly. So it should aim to be used in inclusive and equitable ways that it doesn't simply sorry, deflect problems from rich to poor areas. And in some contexts, it would benefit from being augmented or you know, supplemented by social prevention techniques as well. So the aim is to achieve an appropriate balance. So what I've got up here on the slide is just a key summary of um, a sort of a big picture summary. Um, you might want to even pause the video at this stage to take down these notes, but that's um, a, a good starting point. So here are a few questions and discussion points you might want to think about. What physical features or characteristics of particular locations help to generate crime? Right? What is meant by the term natural surveillance? What does the term defensible space mean? And something you may want to do is think about your local neighborhood area and identify any physical features that you think could be regarded as crime generating according to the um, theory of crime prevention through environmental design and on the flip side think of um, any features that could be crime preventing in terms of how the neighborhood is spatially designed. <laughs>